trading for less than a year, and they're already selling almost as many machines, for much less money, almost as many machines as the top selling non-open source um, producer of 3D printers. Almost all the commercial systems are using the Hewlett-Packard ink cartridge strategy as their economic model. You all know how this works. Hewlett-Packard gives you printers, and then they charge you for ink. Sir? Would you do us all a great big favor and not use the word commercial as opposed to free? Try proprietary and see if you can do Propriety has too many sim s syllables in it, but yes, OK. <laughs> I'll try to do so. Pick me up every time I do it, <laughs> but um, I'll try, try not to do it. OK. Uh, you all know how the HP cartridge strategy works. Uh, HP give you printers and charge you for ink. And they charge you silly prices for ink. And as a consequence, they have a great deal of people with a uh, deal of problems, if they can be called problems, with people making compatible cartridges and so on. All the proprietary, thank you, uh, systems um, use the same strategy for the supply of the plastic that you have to put in the machine for it to build things. Um, typically, if you buy a cartridge for one of the main machines, that would cost about 300 euros, and that contains about 20 euros worth of plastic. And that's a big markup. Um, of course, with this machine, that strategy cannot work. If somebody tries to put one of these machines out or a variation on it, where you need a specific cartridge to uh, operate it, people are just going to design around that. And so that can never happen. Uh, finally. I'm not sure if this quite comes under the heading of economics, but it seemed the best place to put it. Um, the whole idea of home recycling. Uh, we all throw away significant quantities of plastic goods, and typically what happens to those is they're put in big containers and shipped overseas for recycling, an enormously wasteful process, even though it's less wasteful than not recycling at all. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do for a little while with this machine is to have the machine make a plastic shredder that you could, for example, feed plastic milk bottles into, it would shred them, and then have the machine have a right head that you could feed those shreddings into, and it would print objects out. Um, and in fact, there's a pair of child's shoes that were made out of the same plastic that people make milk bottles out of. And of course, what this means is you can print your child's shoes using milk bottles. You've got an entirely local recycling route, no trucks going anywhere. What's more, when your children's feet grow out of the shoes, uh, you just shred the shoes again, shred in another milk bottle, scale the design by 1.1, and um, you've got a new pair of shoes. Um, one of the key things, of course, about the production of anything is labor costs. Um, and another aspect of economics is the capital you require to start manufacturing something. And as we all know, manufacturing industry is migrating, or indeed has migrated, uh, to China, the Far East, to India, and also to countries like Brazil and so on, where labor costs are low, and that's the reason why manufacturing is going to those locations. Uh, however, if you want to start up a factory in China to make digital watches, you still have to invest $100 million in your factory. Of course, in order to set up making things with one of these machines, you only need to invest a few hundred dollars. And what this does is to change the economics of starting to get a foot on the la first rung of the ladder to make things. What it means is that if you're a small community in an impoverished area of the world, you don't need $100 million to start a factory to start manufacturing things. You only need a few hundred dollars as that community to start making things, possibly for the use of just your friends around about near nearby to start off with, which would obviously improve their uh, economic well-being in terms of the material goods that are available to them, at least. Uh, but then you start selling them. And because your labor costs are even lower, in the most impoverished parts of the world than they are even in China and India, then um, you gain that little bit of advantage as well. Um, another interesting aspect of the machine um, is the plastic that, uh, as I say, works best in it, which is this stuff, polylactic acid. Um, you might imagine that you'd be dependent on DuPont or whatever to supply this to you. Uh, in fact, you can grow your own. Polylactic acid can be made from starch. So if you've got a few tens of square meters of land where you can grow a starch crop, like corn or potatoes, um, you've not only got a machine that's self-replicating, you've got a self-replicating supply of the raw material. It's slightly tricky to make, 
in one step. There are four steps to making your own polylactic acid from, uh, cellular, uh, from uh, starch. Sorry. Um, one of them is a difficult one. You have to get it very, very dry. I don't mean you just leave it in the sun to dry out. I mean you've got to get it down to 10 parts per million of water. And that is a little bit tricky. When we've done this in our lab, we've done it by just passing dry nitrogen over it uh, from a cylinder, just an ordinary nitrogen cylinder. That worked. And I conjecture that we haven't tried this, that it should be possible to do it with dry air, made by drying the air through dry calcium chloride. Um, but uh, that's something we haven't tried yet, we need to do. Uh, but it's possible to have one of these machines and to be independent of the world's chemical industry for your supply of the polymer that it uses. And all this, of course, tends to make manufacturing much more like agriculture. Agriculture is our oldest industry, and it's entirely concerned with things that copy themselves. That's how agriculture works. Agriculture works by making economic use of things that copy themselves. Whether that's cows or wheat, they're all things that copy themselves. This machine copies itself. It makes making stuff in the engineering sense economically much more like agriculture. OK, let's move on to biology. Now, I've mentioned agriculture. Um, if you've got something that copies itself, it's going to grow exponentially. Of course, it can't grow without limit, but nonetheless, where opportunity exists, it will grow exponentially. So let's take an example, an everyday plastic object, uh, for which many of you got to use those. You can see I don't. Um, comb on the left. Traditionally, if you want to make one of these, what you do is you buy the machine on the right. Uh, it costs you 200,000 euros or whatever. It's an injection molding machine and you fill it up with nylon and you make some dyes the shape of a comb and this thing injects the nylon into the dyes and the combs get spat out the bottom um, and it makes 10,000, it makes a lot of combs, uh, it makes them fast um, and uh, it's a really effective process, a very expensive capital cost but it's a quick process. Uh, as I mentioned before, a rat rat machine takes two and a half days to copy itself. Let's suppose in those two and a half days that it's got just enough time left to make one pathetic little comb compared with this great machine churning out 10,000 10, an hour. Um, now, you all know the power of an exponential growth, so the question is how many days before the rep rat machines overtake the injection molder? Uh, the answer is 20 days, and then the rep rat machines are making more combs than the injection molder. After a month, there's a rep rat machine for every man, woman, and child on the planet. Now. That's not going to happen for the same reason that we're not up to our necks in rabbits. Um, everything that grows exponentially in number always runs up against resource limitations eventually. Uh, of course, uh, in the case of the machines, it will be places to put them, it'll be whether people want them or not, and it'll be the materials from which to make them, just as it is for living organisms. Uh, the reason why we haven't got rabbits up to our necks is because there's not enough grass for them all to eat. What do people do when they get access to things that copy themselves? Well, the answer is they do this sort of trick. They turn those things into those things. Um, I contend that this is actually humanity's most powerful technology. Nothing we've done since the Industrial Revolution touches it, touches this for sheer elegance and power. Why is it so powerful? Well, for a number of reasons. The first reason is you don't need to know how any of this works in order to use this technology. You can use this technology if you believe that the sun orbits the earth. Indeed, most people who have used this technology believe precisely that, um, historically speaking. Um, it allows you to manipulate matter at the molecular level, the level of DNA, without even knowing what a molecule is. All you need to know to apply this is what you want to end up with. And then the fact that the objects copy themselves does all the rest of the work for you. And of course, one of the reasons, again, why this is such a powerful technology is it's the technology that feeds us all. There are far too many people in the world starving, uh, but we'd all be starving if our ends, as well, we all look fairly well fed, I'm afraid, um, we'd all be starving if our ancestors hadn't done this with wild grass to make the material that feeds us either directly uh, in the form of bread or indirectly in the form of the meat that we eat. Um, so. That's what people do with things that copy themselves. Of course, as far as rep rap's concerned, people, as soon as the, 